Hi everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to the channel. Hope you're all doing well out there today. Tonight, or today, I'd like to do something a little bit different. It's late here at the time of my recording of this audio. I've got myself a beer and I'm going to run through a script that I've recently written that's a bit different to the usual fare of the channel. I'm going to take a quick break from the discography retrospectives and album rankings to talk about politics. Oh dear. <laughs> Specifically in this case, the politics of one man, that being Douglas Pierce, more commonly known as Death in June. Now, I'll assume if you're watching this video, then you are at least passingly acquainted with the name Death in June, but in case you're not, here's a quick recap. Death in June are a band that formed in 1981 under the ashes of the punk band Crisis. Whilst they initially focused on a more post-punk and electronic sound, the band members fell away, leaving sole member Douglas P to carry the band on into more industrial or neo-folk acoustic sounds. The name Death in June is synonymous with the neo-folk genre, and the project has been at the forefront of that movement ever since its inception. Now, to me, Death in June's music is beautiful. It's often simple, just acoustic guitars and you know, light percussion instruments, yet it's hypnotic and gorgeous in its simplicity of, comp of its compositions. Hey, I'm not about to pick up a 12-string acoustic guitar, like it ain't no thing, but you get what I mean. I'm not saying he's a talentless hack, I'm saying there's a beauty to the simplicity of folk music. So what's the problem? Well, let, you tell, let me tell you my story with Death in June. I first heard about Death in June via Facebook, would you believe, when a promoter I was in contact with in the United States pondered publicly via a status update whether it would be worth putting on Death in June. Live, he had been offered them as part of their tour, but wondered if it was worth the fee and the potential hassle of hosting them. Hassle? Why? I googled Death in June and was met with the uh, He's Disabled track, which I promptly listened to. It was all sparkly acoustic guitars and spirited percussion, but with the bizarre chorus of Don't You Know God Is Disabled is disabled, is disabled. Clouds may gather all around you, but he's disabled, he's disabled. Hmm. Interesting. The album from which that song was off, but what ends when the cymbals shatter, stayed with me. I distinctly remember listening to that record whilst lying on a deserted beach, Thailand of all places, and I loved it. I fell in love with it. From that point onwards, I considered myself a Deaf in June fan. I worked backwards from that point rather than forward and dug into the group's classic material, as it were. I fell in love with Nada, an album that takes 80 synthesizer pop and makes it dark, scary, and yet still danceable. The project introduced me to Current 93 and David Tibet, which I'm also eternally thankful. Then I discovered an album from 1987 called Brown Book. Now, Brown Book contains many things that maybe raise my eyebrows. The feckin' totem cop skull on the cover being just the start. Despite being admittedly a cracking album, it was banned in Germany for sampling the anthem of the Nazi party's paramilitary wing. Whilst Douglas P. submitted documentation to the German government, we'll get to this in a bit, explaining why and in what context that sample was used, again we'll get to that in a bit, the album appears to remain banned. The album contains songs such as Runes and Men, and the one that really caught my eyes, Hail the White Grain. Hmm. Hail the white grain, this life, this pain. The album is supposedly named after the post-World War II book, which lists all of those who were associated with Germany's previous National Socialist government too, so yeah, 
there's a lot to digest here. However, it wasn't, honestly, it wasn't until I came across a later record, 1995's Rose Clouds of Holocaust, that I stopped and I said to myself, I need to know more here. The chorus for that title track more or less goes as follows. Rose clouds of holocaust, rose clouds of lies. Rose clouds of holocaust, rose clouds of lies. I've been a Deaf and June fan for years, much like I have with Bertsum, who is one of my all-time favourite black metal artists. The major difference here, however, is that Bertsum's openly extreme political views do not, for the most part, interfere with enjoying his music. You can, in my opinion, listen to Bertsum's music without sympathising with Varg's political views, or with the fact that he's a fucking murderer, let's not forget, because Varg's political views don't really cross with his music. Yes, there's the whole Odinism, Thulean, fucking pagan stuff, but it's not as straightforward as Death in June, at least not visually, because I've always turned a blind eye to Douglas P's bashed out, edgy military stylings. But with that lyric, Rose Clouds of Lies, all of that changed. So in this video, I'm going to be going through a bunch of stuff that Death in June has either written, said, recorded, or placed onto an album cover. I'm going to look at any explanations that I can find online, from Douglas or otherwise in regards to such and offer some of my own thoughts on my findings as and when I can offer something that might be of any use. But as I dug deeper into this world, I found myself making notes and figured, why not make something slightly different for the channel and upload my findings for others who may be in a similar boat or along a similar path of discovery. Remember, I am not here to condemn Douglas P and Death in June, nor am I, and this is important because people fly off without reading or watching things properly, nor am I defending Douglas P or Death in June in any way. I want to make that abundantly clear before someone jumps to conclusions and calls me a fascist, because this is the internet after all. So without further ado, let's begin. What better place to start, then, than with the name Death in June? It's such a powerful name, cut in bold capital letters or sometimes runes, but what does it mean? Thankfully, due to the endless font of knowledge that is the internet, there are several theories. The main one is that Death in June refers to the historic event, the Night of the Long Knives. History buffs may be more familiar with this event as Operation Hummingbird. I'm not a history nogger myself, so let me lift this passage right out of Wikipedia. Chancellor Adolf Hitler, urged by Hermann Goering and Heinrich Himmler, ordered a series of political extrajudicial executions intended to consolidate his power and alleviate the concerns of the German military about the role of Ernst Röhm and his storm units, the Nazi's paramilitary organisation known colloquially as the brown shirts. Now, I've read enough Sven Hassel novels to know that the brown shirts were dedicated Nazi fucks. <laughs> and I actually learned a lot here looking into Rom. Rom was a close friend and ally of Hitler on his rise to power, until, of course, Hitler turned on him and had him executed in the Night of the Long Knives. So remember, kids, if you're best friends with a fucking Nazi, he might have you randomly killed. So this theory about Death in June's name is given weight because Operation Hummingbird is also the name of a Death in June album from, I think, 2000. Also, of course, The Night of the Long Knives took place in June 1934. The second theory is that the name Death in June came from the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in 1914. He was also assassinated, you guessed it, in June. In a video interview, Douglas P seems to enjoy this theory, claiming that it was an event that changed the world and is responsible for the world that we're living in today, all from Franz Ferdinand's execution. So just a quick note, all my sources will be posted in the video description, so if you are inclined to see the stuff I've checked out, you know, 
by all means, follow the links. You're welcome to go down the same rabbit hole that I went down. Anyway, that's enough history. There may be more theories out there, maybe there are, but all of this history lesson is apparently moot. No, there's nothing big, nor clever, nor third Reiki going on here at all. Death in June are named Death in June because Douglas P. misheard the band's drummer. Yeah. Original drummer Patrick Legas. I again, a running theme of Lines and Wax videos. Don't know if I'm saying that guy's surname right. Apologies if I'm not. Way back when the band were rehearsing at the start of their career, Dougie P. was like, You what, mate? Did you just say death in June? That's brilliant. Let's use that. Old Patrick was like, Nah, fam, I never said that, but whatever. That's not a particularly accurate recounting, but it's with such a level of casual dress that the significance of the name Death in June is brushed off by Douglas in a video interview from 2005. And uh, we thought, well, for that first performance, we should actually have a record out. And um, we were recording the 12-inch Heaven Street 3-track, and uh, I misheard something that Patrick said in the recording studio, and, and I thought he'd said Death in June, but he didn't. But I said the name, and it was instantaneous again. It was like, you know, manna from heaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got a name. And uh, so we, we finally had the name, which everyone has a great time interpreting, but even us, with this purely post-rationalization, it was just my hearing. One of the more striking things about Death in June's controversial use of symbolism is their adaption of the Totenkopf. Here it is on their debut album, The Guilty Have No Pride. Here it is on The World That Summer. Here it is on Brown Book. And again and again and again. Now, I must admit, even though I understand that this is a very powerful symbol, especially in mainland Europe, it had some of the bite taken away for me, personally. Now, if you're in the UK, you can probably tell from my accent that I am from South Wales. Tidy! Now, for me, dodgy symbols are a part of my upbringing. Alongside badly written names and artful recreations of cocks and balls, I grew up seeing the emblem from the Free Will's army spray painted on rocks, walls, floors, anything you could spray with a kind of paint, actually. Even today, I can show you three separate drawings of the so called Air Wen, and all three are within five minutes walking distance of my house. In case you were wondering, the Free Will's army were like a toughless version of the IRA, kind of like the inner circle of the Norwegian black metal scene, but instead of conspiring to put churches to the torch, holiday homes in West Wales were the target. There were more hardcore groups in North Wales that did similar work, or at least aspired to, I'm not really sure of the full history of this stuff, but yeah, you know, this is the kind of background that, you know, we grew up against. This symbol I'm talking about, this Eir Wren, is started to be claimed back as a symbol of Welsh pride, rather than something that was used by, you know, a, what is basically a terrorist organization and it's great because maybe we can do what the nazis did with the swastika but in reverse anyway the reason i've brought this up is because i'm no stranger to you know powerful symbolism and i'm no stranger to the death's head skull either like i said it's been diluted somewhat for myself there's a biker gang around these parts where i live called the valley commandos and their logo is you guessed it a death's head skull I've seen this thing everywhere, mainly on the back of leather or denim jackets, for as long as I can remember, a long time before I even knew what a Nazi was, or who Hitler was, even though, you know, you do kind of learn that shit in primary school. Similarly, there were a lot of old boy skinheads around my way, and some of them had Combat 18 tattoos. A lot of these guys were often seen propping up bars with their huge bellies, and it didn't exactly seem like something to be worried about. Even as a teenager, when I knew full well what some skinheads believed. Now, as a fully developed adult, I know how insidious some of these hate groups can be, but when you grow up around that stuff, it kind of just becomes normal. I mean, one of my friend's dads used to play us Johnny Rebel and Screwdriver Records. Yeah, that's not fucking cool. Anyway, so when I saw Death in June using the same skull on their records, I didn't really think much of it. Just another bunch of people from an older generation using scary symbols to make themselves look odd, is what I thought. At one point, the band had these 
uh, Totenkopf skulls superimposed onto the pride flag, which kind of lets me... <laughs> it lets me think that they weren't all that serious about it. Anyway, the Totenkopf skull, and the frequent appearance it makes through the history of Death in June, is one of the first things detractors will, perhaps rightly, pick up on. I mean, why associate yourself with that symbol if you are not at least sympathetic to what it stands for? Douglas has alluded many times to being somewhat fascinated by the power of symbolism. But to the Totenkopf, he points out its use by units of the Prussian army before it was adopted by similar ones in Nazi Germany. To me, this doesn't really hold much water, as you could say the same about the swastika, and it had previous meanings, couldn't you? But you see a swastika now, and you know, you know what that means, you know what that stands for, you know what that represents. So here's a snippet from Wikipedia regarding the meaning of the symbol's constant use by Death in June. Pierce has stated repeatedly that the symbol is not an endorsement of extermination camp atrocities, and the symbol far predates the Third Reich, having been used by the Prussian army under Frederick the Great. Although, the particular version used by Death in June is a modified, faintly grinning version of the SS insignia, Pierce has stated that the symbolism is clear. The token comp for death and the six for the sixth month, June. I have read in similar things in, in interviews with Pierce, perhaps the same one that Wikipedia is referring to here, where he says pretty much the same thing. Okay, so, what about the whip hand? This is Death in June's other well-used symbol. I can't find any links about this being a fascist symbol, which is great because I think it's cool as fuck. I've always wanted it on a t-shirt, but I don't really want to be labelled as a fucking Nazi by association, even though Bertsam shirts are sold by the fucking truckload, but there we go. That aside, there's a bunch of runes, mainly this one, that keep occurring. It's a life rune, the opposite of the inverted death rune, and yes, usage of runes is often associated with nationalist ideologies. These runes are thousands of years old and are just as often used in innocuous circumstances. In line with other right-wing symbolism, the runes, however, maybe do add to the evidence pile, but it's impossible to condemn anybody for using a symbol from an ancient runic alphabet. So, let's start talking about the stuff that sparked this video. Death in June's lyrics. Heaven Street from 1981 alludes to the Nazi German nickname for the path that was taken by Jews and everybody else who caught the trains to the concentration camps and it refers to the path that's taken directly from the train station directly straight into the gas chambers so when they were fucking around they were pumping people straight into those things. There's a line in the song that goes, all is waiting and so is Franz. I, this is believed to be a reference to the guy who was in charge of the Treblinka camp. Now, apparently Douglas P was moved to write a song about this after reading a book about it on the subject, so... This alone is meaningless in regards to Death in June being Nazis. Writing a song about something doesn't necessarily mean you're living and breathing those words. If that was the case, the guys in Cannibal Corpse would be serving a hundred consecutive life sentences. Even so... That aside, it does prove that these kind of themes with, were with the band right from the beginning, from the same era when they were apparently attending many anti-Nazi marches and so forth. This is from 1981, remember, when Death in June was a free piece. It wasn't just uh, Douglas P. fetishizing the military. So, <sighs> there's nothing really of note or worry then across the following few studio albums in the early 90s with David Tibet contributing heavily to Nada, and despite the previous discussed symbols appearing on the cover to the world that summer, it's not until the previously mentioned controversial Brown Book, released in 1987, that we start to return to these kind of uh, themes. So let's dive into Brown Book's lyrics. Hail the white grain, which was one of the things that made me go, uh, for its title, 
contains absolutely nothing that I can decipher as fascist, would you believe? If you go on genius.com somewhere, someone there has attributed the lyrics of Hail the White Grain to being bottomed during anal sex, so bottoming, as in literally receiving the white grain, being on the receiving end of the sodomy. Which is an interesting take on things, but the more I read the lyrics and the more I re-listened to the song, admittedly it's not a take I would have originally ever considered or ever thought of, but it does kind of fit into Death in June's uh, aesthetic, as it were. Similarly, Runes and Men seems to refer to Douglas daydreaming about his favourite subject and drinking wine as he enjoys, you know, rather than anything more nefarious as the title may suggest. There are also biblical references in the song, in the song Runes and Men, such as the line Pillars of Salt, um, which references um, the wife of Lot as she turns back to watch Sodom and Gomorrah burning as God is rain in fire on those cities and uh, and she she is warned previously by an angel not to turn back and look but she does anyway and she gets turned to, to a pillar of salt for her trouble because yeah because god uh there are also mythological references such as medusa and stuff like that but again despite possible inclination of the title runes and men i'm missing any fashed out vibes here really i am so yeah, honestly, I was quite shocked going through Brown Book with a fine tooth comb to find nothing really that stood out in that regard. Ruthlessly. On the Wall of Sacrifice album, on the track called Bring in the Night, there is this line. Hail the order, hail the wheel of the law. Again, it doesn't really mean anything in isolation, but the imagery is there. One thing I did find which I previously thought was innocuous, was the lyrics to the track Because of Him, from the album which I love, but what ends when the symbols shatter. There's a lot of religious imagery and vibes and so on on this thing, which, you know, I always kind of felt that the hymn in question here in this song was God, but check out these lyrics. Because of Him, this world has hope again. Because of Him, the world has got a friend. A friend that will eradicate all life's false humanity, helping one race, one greed to meet their need. So all that may see, that it's also wonderful to care, to love, to cull, to share. Helping one race, one creed to meet their need, what is that? That's a bit sus to me, that is. So all that may see, that is also wonderful to care, to love, to cull, to share. Is because of him about Hitler? Surely that would be a bit on the nose, even for death in June. It could refer to how the individual branches of Abrahamic religions focus so heavily on how only those of their creed, only those that follow their rules and ways, can be saved by a god. If anyone has any thoughts on this one, on this song, I'd love to hear them because these lyrics really are like stuck in my head. From the same album is the song Cuckoo Coo, which stood out because of, well, the KKK. Even the first word is the same. If you search online though, there are countless songs named Cuckoo Coo, so I had absolutely no idea where to start with this one. There's nothing about the lyrics that seem suspect, and I got lost down an internet rabbit hole for a while trying to figure things out, and I got nowhere. So, in the chronological order of things, this brings us up to the album that started this little journey for me, 1995's 
rose clouds of holocaust the first track that pops up on my quest radar is symbols of the sun The line, symbols of the sun, symbols of the winter, immediately to me conjures up ancient symbolism. Symbols, symbols, symbols. <laughs> In particular, the sun wheel, a symbol often adopted by white supremacists. Douglas goes on to pen in the same track, if blood is another colour of hope, then what is love? This is pretty abstract, and I'm fairly close to forcing a square peg into a round hole here, but... Is Douglas talking about blood purity or race? Taking it in context with the other lyrics, I simply do not know. On the same album, 13 Years of Carrion makes reference to the blood scene of Her Majesty, but again whether this is racial or religious is another mystery. In another completely unrelated deep dive, I've recently been reading the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible's Old Testament. Throughout, there are countless references to the seed of the blood, not so much of a majesty, but that initial bloodline of the descendants of Adam and Eve. This carries on throughout the whole book, with some chapters dedicated entirely to just listing the family lineage through history. I'm no Bible scholar, nor am I Christian for that matter, so I'm not really sure of the significance of this, of how it may or may not relate to this work. I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I'm just drawing parallels where I see them. I could be, and I probably am, way off. And thus we arrive at the title track, Rose Clouds of Holocaust. Rose Clouds of Flies. Rose Clouds of Bitter. Bitter, bitter lies. Now again, despite the intense eyebrow-raising nature of those lines, I feel more than ever now plowing through Douglas's entire lyrical canon that he is just teasing us, flirting with these loaded terms and imagery. From the statement which he submitted to the German government, I'll read the whole thing at the end of the video, Douglas says thus about Rose Clouds of Holocaust, and I'm quoting the man directly here. This leads to the song Rose Clouds of Holocaust, issued in 1995. This work was inspired by Midwinter and Midsummer, visits to Iceland where the days during these times of year can be either almost totally dark or almost totally light. Never completely one thing nor the other. I experienced a spiritual epiphany during these visits in 1989 or 1990. The word holocaust is Greek for burnt offerings, normally of a religious kind, and Iceland is full of extinct volcanoes as well as active ones. Its volcanic landscape is the holocaust in question, symbolizing death and rebirth. It has nothing to do with the persecution and extermination of Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, etc. by Germany during the years of the Third Reich. I am a musician, I do not involve myself in politics, and I refuse to be forced into becoming involved in politics. Those are direct words from Douglas Pierce, Death in June. Yeah, interesting, right? Our next suspect lyrical offering comes from 1998's Take Care and Control album. Here are the lyrics for a track called The Odin Hour, which is an interesting title if nothing else. The dawn is ours, if the dream is pure, who invites the world to the final cure? I mean, if the dream is pure, who invites the world to the final cure? I can't explain this one away, folks. This, to me at least, seems straight up in what it's referring to. If this isn't about pure bloodlines and about the final solution, then I don't know what it's about. Again, I welcome enlightenment and alternative takes from anyone listening, so please chime in if you think I'm wrong. 2000's Operation Hummingbird opens with a very strange track where Douglas writes about being banned from Switzerland on these accusations of his sympathies. Again, this is a reminder that this video is not me digging up shit because I have too much time on my hands. These controversies and ambiguities have both served and plagued Death in June over the years. The lyrics to the track 
guerrilla tactics, that's gorilla, not gorilla, are as follows. Through little streets with little minds, Switzerland steps out of time. With cuckoo clocks and cuckoo minds, cuckoo baby get in line. Their banks are filled with Nazi gold, but death in June's banned, I've been told. Douglas P's banned in Lausanne, the fair city in Switzerland, the clean needle in junkie land. This was, as I said, inspired by a real life event. You can feel the bitterness in this one. The most interesting thing about it to me is that he sweepingly calls the country of Switzerland junkie land. Surely he is not insinuating that the Swiss are a majority of heroin users, more like there is some sort of narrative or reference that I am missing. Perhaps the statement here is similar to what is often said about the online social justice movement, which is often accused of reveling in getting things shut down, censored, changed, etc, etc, etc. Douglas's Swiss affair predates the mainstream societal sweep to the left, and of course the tools of social media too, but his point is more or less the same. A string of bell in the wire says, you're shooting dope without a needle. Something to think about, possibly. <laughs> Fast forward then to the final Death in June album to date, 2018's Essence, and to one of my favourite tracks by the artist called The Trigger. Not only did I lose you, I lost myself too. The lyrics go, Not only did I lose you, I lost myself too. Fears on my pillow, under the unlucky Jew. Now, I have absolutely no idea what Douglas might be referring to here. I'm not saying the mere mention of a Jewish person is suspect. I have absolutely no idea what Douglas might be referencing here. I'm not saying that the mere mention of a Jewish person is suspect. I just have no clue as to what he's trying to say. And that's it. I've skipped a lot of compilations, reissues, singles, collaborations, some of which are admittedly with folks such as Boyd Rice, who are also under the same magnifying glass when it comes to their political affiliations. But yeah, anyway, on a slightly lighter note, after poring over the entire Death in June lyrical history, my favourite lyric comes from the The Scent of Genocide, another dodgily titled track, this time from the Peaceful Snow record. That lyric reads as follows. My friend's witch's tit. Yeah, very good. So, that's it for my uh, research, if I can be so bold as to call it that. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on whether Death in June is a project with genuine fascist or right-wing sympathies, or whether its creator simply enjoys flirting with controversial images and words, almost fetishizing in German military and modern Central European history. If you're familiar with Death in June, in any way, please let me know what you think or where you stand on this issue, be you a long-time fan or a vocal detractor or opposer of Douglas P. I would love to hear from you if you have anything to say on the matter of death in June. To play us out, I'm going to read Douglas's statement to the German government, written in response to the banning of several of his albums in Germany, notably Brown Book and seemingly also Rose Clouds of Holocaust. This statement is quite relevant as it references a lot of the points that we have covered in this video and offers Douglas's personal insights into each. The next words you hear will be his. This was a reply sent several months ago in response to a variety of accusations from certain parties that eventually resulted in the Death in June album Rose Clouds of Holocaust being placed at the end of 2005, 10 years after its release, on Germany's Index of Forbidden Fruit that must not be consumed by impressionable Deutsche Jugend. Perhaps some of you will find it of interest. I think my response is quite reasonable, but obviously those who know better did not. Heiliger. Douglas P. I have been told by my music distributor Tesco organization, Germany, that I must provide a statement clarifying my work 
with my group Death in June to a German government agency responsible for censorship in Germany. In the 24 years of Death in June's existence, I have never explained my work. I feel that would make my art ordinary and stillborn and panders to elements within society that seek to control freedom of expression and thought, abstract or otherwise. All art, whether it be the form of music, literature, painting, etc., worth a grain of salt, should be open to interpretation. In turn, this also makes it open to misinterpretation, sometimes good, sometimes bad. It is in the nature of art that challenges it or confronts the consumer or potential consumer to be misunderstood. But here are some facts. Death in June was named after I thought I heard a colleague say those words during our first recording session in 1981. It was an accident of mishearing. I have said this in countless interviews over the years since. It is merely post-rationalization to assume it refers to any one particular event, historic or otherwise. A common interpretation was that it referred to the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo in June 1914. It didn't, and it doesn't refer to anything else other than death in June. Before becoming a musician, I was a student of 20th century history, as is clearly stated in the whole interview with Zillow magazine in 1992. Apparently, a small quote is taken out of context from this interview, referring to my interest in Ernest Rom. I cannot see how one cannot be interested in events and personalities that led directly or indirectly to the biggest tragedy of the 20th century, World War II. The fact that I am homosexual, as was Ernest Rom, was another point of interest that led to a song, Brown Book, written in 1986, before German unification, which uses the Hort Russell Lied to create the atmosphere where a narration juxtaposing the homophobia of a Nazi stormtrooper to the suicidal fatalism of his sexual partner, a Jewish grandmother. The song evokes Germany, 1936. The title comes from the name of the book the communist authorities of former Eastern Germany kept, listing ex-members of the NSDAP and SS, etc., and their positions held in government and other workplaces in West Germany. A thought-provoking song with many contradictory themes, which is typical of Death in June. This leads to the song Rose Clouds of Holocaust, issued in 1995. This work was inspired by midwinter and midsummer visits to Iceland, where the days during these times of year can be almost, a ter- almost totally dark or either almost totally light, neither completely one thing nor the other. I experienced a spiritual epiphany during these visits in 1989-1990. The word Holocaust is Greek for burnt offerings, normally of a religious kind, and Iceland is full of extinct volcanoes as well as active ones. Its volcanic landscape is the Holocaust in question, symbolizing death and rebirth. It has nothing to do with the persecution and extermination of Jews, homosexuals and gypsies, etc. by Germany during the years of the Third Reich. I am a musician, and I do not involve myself in politics, and I refuse to be forced into becoming involved in politics. When the German goth group Das Ick suddenly attempted to politicize the Christmas festival in Hamburg, Germany in 1992, Death in June, along with another English group and Project Pitchfork from Germany, decided to drop out and not become involved in what was, after all, local politics. We wrote, signed, and distributed a joint statement explaining our decision, abhorring all forms of violence directed at anyone, regardless of race, religion, or sexuality. Apparently there had been some trouble in Hamburg, and relocated our performances to a club in Borkum. This became a free night residency where anyone with tickets to the festival who still wanted to celebrate Christmas could do so with death in June, etc. All three nights were sold out. The Dark Christmas Festival was not and felt bits, with the highest political arguments between the remaining goth groups being as to who should headline. It has been a source of resentment from the goth rock stars of Dasik ever since. The music business is filled with jealousy and envy and I attempt to keep my distance from it. Death in June has always been fascinated by symbols and their effects. There is even an album entitled But What Ends When the Symbols Shatter? Totenkopf 6 is a simple one conveying death in June, the sixth month, but since 1984, fist holding a whip and six has also been extensively used to symbolise death in June. 
In English, we have an expression, to hold the whip hand, which means to take control. In 1997, Death in June issued an album called Take Care and Control. Everything is connected, everything is symbolic, and everything that on a surface level is mutually contradictory is important in the world of Death in June. The two words, rose clouds, are beautifully juxtaposed to each other, and with of Holocaust added, the contradictory imagery is complete. The joy of sadness recognised and a life filled with lies abandoned. In life books, the swirling sound of swastikas like rotor blades of thought brings this conversation piece between two close friends to an end. The Sanskrit word for sun wheel brings perfect closure to a night filled with bad dreams. Dawn has arrived at and surely if the word swastika in itself is justification for a German government investigation into any work of art, then I hope the more famous Iggy Pop and David Bowie's China Girl visions of swastika in my head and Primal Scream's swastika eyes, plus many others deserve equal investigation. In June 2004, I was invited to perform in Tel Aviv, the capital of Israel. Death in June did so to an enthusiastic audience of over 500 people and there are even pictures of me on stage weaving a Totenkopf 6 flag alongside an Israeli one. I did numerous interviews with both Israeli magazines and radio stations. Death in June LPs and CDs are freely available in Israel. T-shirts are even licensed for manufacture there. I find it ironic that I am so welcomed in Israel yet I am suspiciously viewed by the German authorities for censorship but I suppose that fits well with the contradictory nature of death in June. I'm also unsettled by the fact that in Germany, a modern Western democracy and civilization, government censorship of the arts should even be entertained. That along with the organizations or individuals that have brought me to your attention, smell more of Germany's past than any of death in June's recordings. My father was a career officer in the British Royal Air Force, fought as a pilot against Hitler's Luftwaffe during World War II and was shot down twice, but survived. His first wife was not so lucky and was killed in the London Blitz. I have a stepsister as a result of that death. His three brothers, my uncles, were all frontline soldiers and the youngest was one of the first troops in the British Royal Artillery to enter Bergen-Belsen and drove bulldozers shoveling the dead inmates into mass graves. All of them thought the only good German was a dead German. Coming from such an anti-German family background, I have always considered myself part of a generation that was responsible for the reconciliation between our two countries. I feel that reconciliation has been achieved. We live in 2005, not 1945. I trust that any review of my work is based upon official releases, all obtainable from, but not necessarily distributed by, Tesco Organization Germany. I cannot be held responsible for unofficial releases which have nothing to do with Death in June, but falsely claim to be. Douglas P. Death in June. Well, that's it folks. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Take care out there. See you in the next one. And why did you say the things shall fall? And fall and fall and fall and fall apart And why did you say the things shall fall? And fall and fall and fall and fall apart And shall I away from dreams for the glory of nothing For the cracking of the sun, for the crawling down the lines Any, uh, any misconceptions about you that you want to you wanna clear up? No. <laughs> you like people talking about you. Do you think that's... My ears burn constantly. <laughs> I lie awake at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I can set, tell my partner, something's going on out there. Somewhere in the rest of the world where it's like midday, something is going on.